Joining us now to talk uh, Stars hockey is a Sean McKendo here of The Athletic with a game one tonight, 7.30, Stars and Oilers. And a good afternoon to you, sir. How the heck are you? Hey, I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. It's it's great to have you. Do you think there is an easy pick in this one, in this series? No, uh, there, there isn't. And I got to say, uh, even though you, you, people down there may not want to hear it, I, I'm a little surprised at how the consensus has emerged with the, of the Dallas Stars as as seemingly heavy favorites in this one, uh, at, at least as far as you know, when we did our expert picks at the Athletic, I want to say it was something like 80% Dallas, and uh, I've, I've seen similar stuff somewhere else. And I get it to an extent. Uh, the Edmonton Oilers did not look like they were at their best against Vancouver. And if they play seven games like that against the Dallas Stars, then the Dallas Stars are going to win this series. I'm not convinced Edmonton plays that way, though. I, I, I think they've sort of survived their uh, their little mini slump, and uh, the Oilers team is scary. So uh, I, that doesn't mean that uh, that necessarily they they beat Dallas, but uh, this is going to be a tough series, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be one where it gets decided by the stars, uh, the the superstars, so to speak, the best players. And uh, Edmonton's got a couple of those that are real real hard to stop. Sean, do you think that Edmonton does have the better stars? At the top end, yes. I mean, there, there's that's no disrespect, no insult no, to, uh, yeah. to Dallas. There's not a player on the planet better than Connor McDavid. I mean, I'm a, I'm an old guy, and I'm not completely convinced that I've seen anyone uh, better than this kid. Uh, maybe apart from Mario Lemieux, Wayne Gretzky, that's probably the whole list. Mm. Uh, and Leon Draisaitl is is. Uh, solidly in the conversation as the second best player in the league, especially come playoff time. He is one of those few uh, elite players in this league where everything gets so much tougher, so much harder to score in the playoffs, he somehow gets better. He somehow gets more productive. So, I, I mean, I think these are the two best players left in the playoffs, period, um, let alone in this series. Now, that having been said, Dallas obviously has quite a bit of elite talent as well. And when you start getting down the list and you say, okay, we can't match their top two players, but here, here's our third best player, fourth, fifth, go on down the list. Suddenly that, that depth starts to add up and you start to see an Edmonton team that's maybe a little bit top heavy. That's always been the knock against them for the last few years is they've got those two superstars, but not enough around them. Dallas is a more balanced team, top to bottom. Uh, probably a better team, at least on paper. But hey, as as far as the superstars go, uh, nobody in this league can touch the Edmonton Oilers as far as those very top guys. Sean, where's the goaltending hinge for both teams here? Is uh, Does one team have an advantage? It appears to me that Edmonton has used a couple of different netminders, but uh, where where are you at on the goaltenders for this series? Yeah, I mean, that that is always the big story of playoff time. So often it feels like whichever team has the best goaltending uh, is the team that wins the series. That doesn't mean the team with the best goaltender, right. because sometimes we see guys get hot. But it's been the big story in Edmonton. Stuart Skinner was supposed to be the guy going into the playoffs, seemed okay against the L.A. Kings, was not good against Vancouver, in fact was so poor that uh, he was knocked out of the series for uh, a couple of games, not by injury, by coach's decision. They they just said, uh, we got our season on the line, we cannot trust this kid uh, to, to be our guy, even though that was the plan heading in. Uh, Calvin Picard came in, played a couple of games, played well, not amazing, but well enough to, to steady the ship. They went back to Stuart Skinner and it worked. So now if you're Edmonton, you're sitting there with maybe some confidence that this guy can be good enough. Again, he, he doesn't have to be great. He doesn't have to steal the series because they've got the other guys to do that. He just needs to not be a, a mess. He needs to not be the reason that you lose, and, and he very nearly was that in Vancouver. Dallas, you look at, on the other hand, on paper, Jake Ottinger is easily the best goaltender in this series. It's It's not even close. He has been good in the playoffs. We haven't necessarily seen that greatness from him quite yet, which isn't necessarily bad news because if you're the Dallas Stars, you're still here. You're still into round three. You've still beat two excellent teams, and you've done it without Jake Ottinger absolutely standing on his head. You're sitting there going, okay, if he does it against Edmonton, we're going to be just fine. And he's, he's a good young goaltender. He's got a good track record. He's a huge kid, which is great because size does not have a slump. Uh, and you got to figure you're you're pretty confident here. If 
Dallas is going to win this series, they're going to get the better goaltending. There really isn't a scenario where Stuart Skinner outplays Jake Ottinger and the Edmonton Oilers don't win. The question for Dallas is, how much better can Jake Ottinger be, and can he be a guy who even steals a couple of games, a couple of games that are supposedly going to be those Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl games, and instead it's our goalie who slams the door. Yeah, Sean, where do you the, the, the Stars have played really, really well on the road. Do you give them any type of advantage going into this series being able to do that? Yeah, I mean that that certainly helps, and you know it's it's funny. It's been something that to those of us who watch the NHL for for years and years now, we've said you know home ice advantage in the NHL not not that big a deal. Right. Seating doesn't seem to be that big a deal. You looked at the numbers; it was fifty two percent or whatever it was, uh, and then you got this year where the home teams are ten and two. You could make a strong case that the favorite has won every single series. Everything's going to chalk so far, which is very, very unusual in the NHL. Uh, if you're the Dallas Stars, hey, first of all, you're you're happy to have home ice because that means if this thing goes to a seventh game, which a lot of us think it absolutely might, you're going to be playing that on home ice in front of your fans. That's going to be a good situation. And the fact that when you have to go into Edmonton, you're going to have to win some games there. Uh, you feel good about it. You're sitting there going, look, we know we're going to go into a loud building. It's the last Canadian team left. They've got the pressure of an entire nation on them. Uh, it's going to be a crazy situation. Some teams would wilt under that. Dallas, I don't think they do. They they seem really well attuned to it. Um, they've been fine but when they have to go on the road, and, uh, and, and they pulled out some games that turned series around, uh, and certainly – Round one against Vegas being the, uh, the the great example of that, where they had to win two in, in one of the toughest buildings in the league. No sweat. Went in and did it. They can do it again in Edmonton. They're going to have to do it. They're going to have to execute on that. Talking stars with Sean McKendo of The Athletic. No Rupe hints for the stars tonight. How b- big of a factor is that? Yeah, I mean, that, that hurts. It's uh, a, a good player like that who can contribute offensively. Um, it, it's it's always a case in the playoffs that you need as many weapons as you can because you never know who it's going to be on a given night. Uh, it's, it's a game where when teams are playing a long series and they've got time to really prepare, this isn't a one-off in the middle of February. This is something where, you know, Edmonton's coaches have been sitting down and they've been saying, okay, how do we neutralize Jason Robertson, how do we take advantage of that blue line? Let's look at every single matchup. Let's look at anything that we can exploit. And when you've got a guy like Rupa Hintz who can come in and be an, uh, a guy who isn't necessarily the best player on the team, uh, but is a guy who can be one of those guys who, who comes in and that you have to account for, him not being there, missing somebody like that, uh, it has a big impact in the playoffs, a bigger impact than it would during the regular season where maybe something like that flies under the radar a little bit more. Uh, that means that somebody in Edmonton doesn't have to worry about that matchup, which means that they slip down to the next guy on the line and, and, and all the way down it sort of trickles back and forth between the two lineups. So, uh, look, it, the injuries are a part of hockey this time of year. There's going to be more in this series. There's going to be guys who are going to miss time as this series goes on. Uh, and very often that stuff evens out. Sometimes it doesn't. But to start with it, least when you look at the names that are missing that's the biggest one in this series and it's on the dallas side we're talking hockey here with sean mckendo of the athletic if this would go to seven games what do you think about pete DeBoer there in in the in the seven game and in, in his record and what all goes into that you know what it, it, it has to give you a little bit of an advantage right if you're the dallas stars because we all know that the, this guy just does not lose game sevens and when you have a streak like that I, you know so often the cliche is the game seven very often feels like a coin flip and uh, you know that sometimes the coin comes up heads three or four times in a row not a big deal not not something that we really have to think too hard about but when it gets to be five or six you think okay maybe something's happening here when it's seven or eight times that the same guy is winning over and over again in game seven it almost becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling thing it you know does it does it matter is this just luck or is he got something here is there something that he's doing and the answer might be it doesn't matter if it's just luck. If the players believe it, if the coaching staff, if it gives them a little bit of an extra lift, if it even maybe goes across the hallway into that Oilers dressing room and they're sitting there going, oh, man, now we got to go up against this guy. He's Mr. Game 7 as far as coaching goes. Uh, what's he going to do? What's he going to throw at us that maybe we're not anticipating? It can become self-fulfilling because it ends up uh, being that you're waiting for the advantage and that becomes the advantage itself. Uh, look, he's a very good coach. He's obviously prepared. He's obviously, whatever it is he's 
saying in those pregame meetings, you know, whether he's getting them fired up or calming them down or whatever level they need to find, he's very, very good at that. Um, anything can happen in a winner-take-all game seven, and, and, and maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, although it, it really feels like that's that's where we may be headed in this one as well. Um, but, yeah, if, if you've got to do a game seven and you've got to look back behind the bench and say, okay, who's, who's our guy back there? Who's coming up with the strategy and the game plan and who's going to fire us up? Hey, you got a guy who's had more success in that scenario than pretty much anyone in the history of the NHL. Sean, were you surprised that the Panthers went into Madison Square Garden and got him one last night? I wasn't surprised they got the win. I, I was a little bit surprised in how it played out, uh, just in, in the sense that we really didn't feel like we got a great game out of the New York Rangers. I, I think certainly they had to be frustrated at how that played out. We talked about home ice advantage. They have got home ice throughout the playoffs. They had the best record in the regular season. you got to work really hard to do that, and then you sort of see it all fall apart in a, in a game one in the uh, what's supposed to be the world's most famous arena, this tough place to play, and Florida comes in and pulls off really a, a, a near-perfect road game. That'll happen. No team is ever at fully at their best game in and game out for a seven-game series because uh, you're playing against good teams, and good teams have a way of making you look bad. But it does concern me a little bit if I'm a Rangers fan that I'm looking at that and saying that if I'm going to lose this series, that's exactly what it's going to look like. Great mm. goaltending from Florida, a good yeah. defensive game, us not doing enough at five on five. We know that on special teams, on a power play, we can be good, but we don't. We're not able to find it five on five and and not able to get that goal past Sergei Bobrovsky. I'd be a little bit concerned. Obviously, you go out, you win uh, game two. It's an even series, and we're back to square one. You lose game two, though, you put yourself in that situation. Whether you play great or not, it's going to be very, very tough for them to come back. Not impossible, but a really long road. Sean, can we get the NHL to just stop these interference and offside reviews? I mean, when can we get that implemented? I I'd love to, man. That that you're uh, you're preaching the choir on that because I've uh, I, I've been saying for a few years now, and I wrote a piece on the Athletic this week where I said this is not working, and the best way to fix it is to scrap it. Uh, yes, there's things we could be doing better. I've written a. a bunch of pieces over the years on hey we could tweak this we could we could do that uh there's certainly some some things we could do to make this system better but at the end of the day i don't know what we're doing in the world's fastest game to stop everything over a couple of millimeters here and there and freeze frame it and slow mo it and all of this the the offside review was was ridiculous it was a mistake we did it because matthew shane was 10 feet offside 15 years ago we haven't caught a single one like that in the 11 years we've had this thing. Let's get rid of it. And as far as the goaltender interference, uh, look, I, I've been banging the drum for years that this rule is not a, a, the complicated mystery people think it is. It is a little bit more predictable. It's more consistent. But it's not a good rule for review. It's subjective. It comes down to opinion. And you can freeze frame it all you want. I can't freeze frame you something that shows you whether contact was incidental or not or anything like that. And I, what I would love to see if the, those who are old like me remember, back in the 90s, we had a terrible rule. It skate in the crease, no matter what came out. We got rid of it. We got rid of it. Why did we get rid of it? Well, you guys might remember there's a little <laughs> something involving Brett Hall and the yeah. Buffalo Sabres, and, you know, we don't need to dig too far into it, but it made everybody mad, and the NHL, to their credit, for once said, you know what, we just screwed up, and we don't need to fix this. Let's just get rid of it. I'm saying that they screwed up on this replay review now. Just get rid of it. Just, that That's the fix right there, and we can just all go back to sometimes calls get missed and we live with it. Were you uh, covering hockey in the 90s? I, I wasn't covering it, no, but I was a fan, and I was watching, yeah. and I, you know, I was watching on Hockey Night Canada and getting all mad because, you know, oh, Brett Hall scored with his uh, skate in the crease, and sure. watching the NHL come out and try to explain it and uh, and, and being frustrated about it. Hey, I, I mean, I, I was a fan then, I'm a fan now, I, I approach it from that perspective, and I'll tell you, man, as a fan, I hate having to, I, I hate it when a goal gets scored, and instead of going, wow, that was amazing, my brain goes, wow, that was amazing, but hold on because there's there's a 10% chance that we're all going to stand around and look at iPads for the next 10 minutes. Yeah, Sean, I miss the days of Ron Hexall just taking his stick in the back of those uh, those uh, guys in front of the net. You know that that cleared space for, that cleared space for goalies, him, Bernie Perrant, guys like that that just used to hack in the back of those exactly. guys' screens. That that would Nobody keep, ever interfered with never, Smith because never. It was, you yeah. know, you did, and yeah. uh, you'd, you'd wake up in the trainer's room three days later. Absolutely, absolutely. Sean, great uh, report here. Our texts are wondering if you grew up not liking the Stars for one reason or another. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I can tell you this. Uh, I grew up 
uh, wasn't even the Stars. It was the Minnesota North Stars back then. Oh, wow. And I, I grew up as a Maple Leafs fan, which was the old-time Norris division, right? Yeah. The nasty stuff, right? Uh, you, you see games these days, you know, two teams, oh, they don't like each other. That was every single game in the Norris. So uh, I grew up not liking the Minnesota North Stars back to, you know, the Basil McRae days. He'd come into Maple Leaf Gardens, and, and you had to take care of him. Um, Cesar so, Montiago, uh, yeah, go back that maybe far? There's a little bit of that, man. Maybe there's maybe there's some animosity there, but it's <laughs> it's that old time animosity that then turns into into the respect over the years. And sometimes you don't know what you got till it's gone. I miss the Norse Division a lot, and so I still got a place in my heart for uh, for the North Stars now, the Dallas Stars. I love it. I've been in this game for a while. I bet we're around the same age, and I I still have a lot of fan in me. So I salute you for that, Sean. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you next time. Right on. Sounds good, guys. Salute. <laughs>